Chapter Seven of The Problem Club. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Scarno, Walsall, West Midlands, England. The Problem Club by Barry Payne. The Shakespearean Problem. The failure of the members to discover the identity of Leonard, the last problem that he had set them, meant that, at the 49th meeting, the price was doubled, and the cheque of £220 awaited the lucky winner. Leonard, formerly known as a capable head-waiter and an astute setter of problems, had revealed himself as the grandson and heir of the Lord Herngill, who had founded the club and had been elected to membership he had described himself further as a poet he had now travelled up from yorkshire for the express purpose of attending the first meeting after his election and the dinner with which the proceedings opened showed him as had been expected a charming accomplished and quite amusing companion Young Heseltine and the Reverend Septimus Cunliffe were, respectively, chairman and secretary for the evening. The chairman, equipped with a bound copy of Shakespeare and certain other forms of refreshment, read out the terms of the competition. They were longer than usual and ran as follows. Members are required, in the course of conversation, to make undetected quotations from Shakespeare and to detect and challenge the quotations which are made by other members. The score is two for making an undetected quotation, and one for detecting and challenging a quotation made by another. The highest score wins. If any member challenges a quotation from Shakespeare, words which are not a quotation from that author, he will have one deducted from his score. Any member with a score of minus three is out of the game. The method of challenging will be by raising one hand, when the chairman will temporarily arrest proceedings and investigate. Where several members raise their hands simultaneously, all will score the detection, or be penalized for the failure, as the case may be. Otherwise, only the first hand up can score or be penalized. A quotation must consist of more than four words, or it will not rank as a quotation. The words must be given in their correct order, but otherwise any attempt may be made to disguise the quotation. Any member who has made an undetected quotation shall notify it to the chairman at the earliest opportunity, while it is still fresh in the memory. Detection, to be valid, should be made immediately, say, within 20 seconds of the utterance of the quotation. The chairman will stop the competition when, in his opinion, all members have had a fair and full chance of speaking, and on all disputed points his ruling is absolute. Yes, said the chairman, when he had read out the above. Our new problem-setter, the mysterious editor of the pig-keeper's friend, seems to be a rather lengthy beggar. More like a round game than a problem, to my mind. I can imagine literary circles playing it on winter evenings. However, I think we've most of us got the hang of it. There's double the usual amount of boodle in the jackpot, but all the same, I'm not sorry to be debarred from competing. I had a good deal of Shakespeare boosted into me by schoolmasters when I was a boy, but I fear that it ain't stuck to me. Well, it's all up to the highbrows tonight, and I'll call on our old friend Leonard, who's our new member, Lord Herngill, to start the ball rolling, and our padre to keep the score as directed. Well, said Leonard, I can't say that I am a stranger here, but I'm certainly a new member. And very glad to be. Now, I told you that I was a poet, but a writer of poetry is not necessarily a reader of poetry. 
I can't say whether he ought to be or not. He paused to relight a cigarette. To be candid. A challenge, said Mr. Cunliffe with uplifted hand. The quotation is, to be or not to be, rather cunningly broken up. Admitted, said Leonard. Then, said the chairman, the secretary will score one to himself. At the same time, said Leonard, I should like him to score two to me. The words, I am a stranger here, are a quotation from King Richard the Second, Act Two, Scene Three. Northumberland speaks them, and the quotation was not recognized. This was verified and found correct, and the score allowed. The chairman turned to the Honourable James Feldane, who was sitting, or to be accurate, reclining, in the chair next to Leonard. "'Go ahead, Jimmy,' he said. "'Very well,' said Jimmy wearily. "'The... Uh, the quality of mercy.' Five hands went into the air together. "'Jimmy,' said the chairman, "'it looks as if you were pretty considerably challenged by five hands simultaneously. "'You, Major Biles, being one of them, will tell us why.' "'Why?' exclaimed the Major. "'Because it's one of the best-known quotations in Shakespeare. "'I won't swear which play it comes from, but everybody knows it. "'Let's see. How does it go?' The quality of mercy is not strained, but droppeth like the thingamy of the something or other. Any defence, Jimmy? asked the chairman. Somewhat, said Jimmy. I said, the quality of mercy. I admit it. I glory in it. But that's only four words, and it's laid down that four words do not make a quotation. That is so. I fear that the Major, Dr. Alden, our only KC, and our two artist members must all have a minus one recorded against them. What I was going to have said when they interrupted me was that the quality of mercy differed in some material respects from coffee that has been made with a percolator. Same thought as Shaky's, but a different mode of expression. Five of you have now lost a life through being premature. You need to be careful. A score of minus three puts you outside of any chance of two hundred and twenty of the very best. And I'm dangerous tonight. I'm out for blood. The brindled cat whines slowly over the lay. Anybody like to challenge that? Wildersley said it would make a good title for an academy picture. But nobody asserted that it was Shakespeare, not even Jimmy. You're an unenterprising lot, said Jimmy disdainfully. But I'll give you one more chance. Satiate at length and heightened as with wine. That's more than four words. Any challenges? Yes, said Sir Charles, holding up his hand. I don't know for certain. "'but it's got the flavour of the period in it. "'Anyway, I'd sooner lose one life "'than let you score a triumphant two for it. "'Then you'll lose the life. "'It's a quotation, all right. "'But it happens to be a little bit "'that I cut out of the best end of Paradise Lost "'by J. Milton, Esquire.' "'And Jimmy leant back in his chair, satisfied. "'He had scored nothing for himself.' but he had done something to spoil the chances of six other men. The chairman turned to Sir Charles. Don't you think that Jimmy's an irreverent young blackguard? he asked. Well, said Sir Charles with an air of quiet dignity, Jimmy is young and I am old. As we progress on life's journey, we old men cease to expect to find universal agreement with our views. We know that our opinions are our own, but cannot be all the world's. He paused and sighed. A stage or two farther on, and Jimmy may come to think, as I do now, that, 
and here suddenly sir charles broke off and chuckled well i am blessed he said i never expected to do it i knew this wasn't a little nest of shakespeareans but i did think that you'd spot the best known line in shakespeare that air of pathetic dignity had merely been a bit of acting but the acting had been so good that it had distracted the attention from the words otherwise members must have found in sir charles's remarks the well-worn tag that all the world's a stage it scored two for sir charles thus putting him on the way to a win at any rate a few minutes later another well-known quotation very nearly came through unscathed somebody speaking of leonard had said leonard or lord herngill whichever he prefers to be called leonard smilingly said that a rose by any other name would smell as sweet he admitted afterwards that he had not had the slightest intention of quoting shakespeare he had merely uttered a platitude because it happened to be apt though as soon as he said it he recognized his own quotation unfortunately for him the rev septimus cunliffe had also recognized it and by challenging it added one to a score that was growing slowly but surely he attempted no quotation himself and never challenged unless he was sure to put it plainly he played for safety yes said jimmy feldane plaintively commenting on this incident one of the worst points about mr w shakespeare is that he made such a lot of proverbs i don't want to brag but i suppose i've read as little as most people and i expect that even i don't keep clear of shakespearean quotations altogether i'm not aiming at him but every now and then he flies into it so to speak the supercilious mr quillian had provided himself with a stock of quotations from elizabethan dramatists other than shakespeare and did deadly work with them they were challenged and brought the penalty on the challengers and having thus inspired a dread of traps he introduced three quotations which really were from shakespeare and two of them got through undetected pusely smith who generally welcomed a chance of a friendly duel with quillian remained silent watching him with sardonic amusement the game became very strenuous there was the closest attention in order to spot any veritable quotation every strategic dodge that had been thought of during the previous month was brought into action to induce a challenge that would be penalized or to get the quotation through undetected several members reached minus three and were ruled out this game is too much for me said mr matthews on losing his third life it's too subtle the american game of draw poker with three jokers in the park and one of the players a crook is simple transparent and childlike compared to it however one of the joys of being out of it is that i can get myself that little drink that i have long needed and he made his way to the side table mr chairman said sir charles i think a ten minutes interval would be welcome it's wearing work to keep on thinking what one is saying his suggestion was warmly supported and accepted by the chairman some members followed the comfortable example of mr matthews some chuckled over the clever caricatures drawn on the back of bridge markers with which wildersley had been occupying his enforced leisure an excess of zeal over discretion had put him out of the game at an early stage all consulted the secretary's score sheet quillian was leading with the score of nine the secretary and sir charles were each at eight major biles was three and pusely smith one jimmy felden 
was minus one, and Lord Herngill, who had at one time reached the noble score of four, had by reckless challenging brought himself to the perilous position of minus two. "'Can't make it out,' said Mr. Matthews to him. "'You used to set all our problems. You ought to be a flyer at this kind of a game.' "'It's an easy job to set problems,' said Leonard, "'and to set them so that you can solve them. "'But it's a different thing altogether "'to solve the problems that somebody else has set.' "'Oh, well, it's an opening thing still. "'Quillian's just leading, "'but I don't believe he'll pull it off. "'Shan't be surprised if old Bunford "'is two hundred and twenty the richer "'before the evening's out.' Proceedings were now resumed. "'Come now, Peasley Smith,' said the chairman. "'We've not heard much from you tonight.' "'Afraid of being challenged?' suggested Quillian. "'As a rule,' said Peasley Smith angrily, "'I am told that I'm much too adventurous. "'However, my learned friend, if you want to talk, go on, and I will wait for you.' The chairman called on me to speak, not you. And as a matter of fact, I had a thing to say. But let it go. It may make trouble later. And then you'll remember I told you what would come of this. Your blessed challenges, indeed. You may think you can do everything, but I know you can do very little. Quillian stared at him, aghast and perplexed. Uh, uh, really he said i don't understand this outburst i had not the slightest intention but here he was interrupted by pusely smith's laughter <laughs> all right old man said pusely smith cheerily don't worry it was all spoof and part of the game thanks to you i've just made five undetected quotations from the work of the bard you're my benefactor. In fact, as the Orientals say, you are my father and my mother, and I am the son of a dog. Five? said the chairman. It hardly seems possible. But Pusely Smith made out his list, and it was found to be quite correct. The five quotations were as follows. I am much too venturous, King Henry the Eighth. Act One, Scene Two, and I will wait for you, Julius Caesar. Act One, Scene Two. I had a thing to say, but let it go, King John. Act Three, Scene Three. I told you what would come of this, The Winter's Tale. Act Four, Scene Three. I know you can do very little, Coriolanus. Act Two. Scene one. It's a great coup, said the chairman. It puts you right at the head of the list. Closing time is imminent, gentlemen. So if you have anything else to say, get on with it. Well, said Quillian, somebody ought to have spotted him. It's really more our carelessness than his cleverness. But I should imagine that's the last undetected quotation he'll be able to get through tonight. You're a watchman now. "'By Jove, yes,' said the Major. "'Since you talk like that,' said Pusely Smith, smiling, "'I will make another quotation. "'By the way, how long will you give me? "'I should have asked you that before, of course.' Five minutes,' said the Major, "'and then perhaps we might close the competition "'if the chairman sees fit.' "'A general agreement was reached on this point, "'and Pusely Smith, was enjoined by the chairman to get on with it. "'I've finished, thanks,' said Pusely Smith. "'The words, I should have asked you that before, "'are a quotation from a play called Romeo and Juliet. "'It's the second scene of the first act, Romeo speaking.' "'The quotation was verified and advanced Pusely Smith's score to thirteen, "'a lucky number for once, thus leaving him an easy winner. And, said the young Heseltine, the chairman, 
as he handed him the check. Considering the way you must have sweated through tons and tons of absolute Shakespeare during the month in order to pick out the little bits that didn't look like quotations, I'm not sure that you haven't earned about 5% of it. The chairman now opened the sealed envelope containing the problem for the next month. In this, the talented editor of the pig keeper's friend had been quite brief. It was entitled, The Impersonation Problem, and the terms of it were as follows. It is required to be mistaken for six different people in the course of one hour. You don't use any unnecessary words about it, said Mr. Matthews. But it may be remembered that the editor of The Pig Keeper's Friend was also a poet. And real poets never use unnecessary words. End of chapter 7 Recording by Mary Scano Walsall, West Midlands, England Chapter 8 of The Problem Club This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Problem Club by Barry Payne The Impersonation Problem The terms of the impersonation problem, which came up for adjudication at the 50th meeting of the club, were as follows. It is required to be mistaken for six different people in the course of one hour. Mr. Wildersley, A.R.A., large, cheerful, and childlike, took the chair and observed that it was just as well for other members that the dignified position of adjudicator prevented him from competing, as otherwise he would have been a certain winner. It was a claim that the chairman for the evening very frequently made, but Wildersley was not very serious about it. My profession, he said, would have given me a start of about eighty yards in the hundred. I'm skilled in the rapid use of oil paints. Within the prescribed limit of one hour, I could have painted myself to look like a rabbit or a tomato or a man or a hole in the ground or any other object of the seashore, so as absolutely to defy detection. Not one of you duffers would have had a chance. Pardon the interruption, said Mr. Quillian, K.C., but the terms of the problem require us to be mistaken for six different people. May I ask the chairman if he would consider a rabbit and a tomato as being people for the purposes of this problem? The time of the chairman, said Wildersley, severely, is not to be wasted on purely hypothetical cases. If, when his turn comes, Mr. Quillian claims to have been mistaken for a rabbit, I shall be ready both to believe it and to adjudicate upon it. And now, gentlemen, we will have the story of your dismal failures. Hesseltine here is acting as secretary tonight, and he may as well get his talking done first, so that he can give his undivided attention to his duties. Well, said Hesseltine, Feldane and I went into partnership this time, as the rules permit. We don't claim to have scored the full six, but we had a lovely time while it lasted. Jimmy had better tell you about it, as he played the lead. Yes, said Jimmy, with a wary smile. It was quite on the amusing side. Involved a lot of work, though, thinking it all out and getting together the properties for the drama. If we scooped fifty-five pounds each over it, we shouldn't be overpaid, but just as we were doing nicely, the bottom fell out of it. However, I'll tell you. The incidents which Jimmy related were as follows. Early on a fine morning, he and Hesseltine were conveyed by a taxicab to a point previously selected on a road on the outskirts of a southwestern suburb here they unloaded their miscellaneous collection of properties and got to work the driver took the cab off to a public house in the vicinity and there awaited further orders hesseltine was disguised as a laborer jimmy who was to act as his boss was got up as to use his own description a sort of semi-scientific clerky person clad in a seedy suit, a pince-nez, and an air of educated wisdom. They began by enclosing a portion of the roadway with stakes and ropes, fixing red flags at the corners of the square. Then Hesseltine entered the enclosure and began vigorously to dig a hole in the road with spick and spade. It was still early, and there were few people about, so Hesseltine's boss condescended to lend a hand with the digging. Afterwards, Felding contented himself with strolling round the hole with a voltmeter, 
borrowed from the taxicab in one hand a two-foot rule sticking out of his breast pocket and a general air of importance when the hole was about three feet deep a sleepy policeman paused on his way past something wrong with the drains he asked hope not said felden cheerfully but that's what we're going to find out we're just putting in the smoke test on this section i see said the policeman you ain't from mackworth are you mackworth's oh no we're from matthews and biles the sanitary engineers at Vauxhall. dare say you know the name the policeman said he believed he'd heard it and passed on the game had now definitely begun and there was only one hour to play it in and no time to be lost a small car was approaching with the lady driving Feldain ran into the road held up his hand and stopped it sorry man he said to the lady but would you mind waiting just for a few seconds i'm sure you'll understand we've got an ericsson's galvanometrical balance working in that hole and the least vibration would spoil the reading we shan't be a minute certainly said the lady i know something of these delicate instruments what are you using it for we're from the post office electrical survey there's trouble with the telegraph wires here that they can't locate of course if iron pyrites has been used in the construction of the road that would account for it we're looking into it bill he called to hesseltine what do you make it hesseltine examined the bottom of the hole steady at two point five he called back good let this car pass and then set a foot further in thank you very much ma'am the unsuspecting lady drove on hesseltine sat down in the hole and laughed jimmy glanced at his watch that's two and under ten minutes he said if we can keep it up at anything like this rate we ought to do but for some time after this passers-by proved curious but unenterprising they stared with the keenest interest at the proceedings but did not put in any inquiry then an elderly tramp paused on his way into the town watermain he suggested ay said jimmy all that work for a little water sooner you than me almost immediately afterwards a rather fussy and important little man demanded to know what it was all about gas said jimmy laconically there's no gas main in this road snapped the little man no said jimmy nor likely to be until we've took the level for the pipes pass along please the little man said that it seemed hopeless to expect a civil answer to a civil question nowadays but he passed along jimmy again consulted his watch for in half an hour he observed we can hardly miss it now but fate was already on its way in the shape of a young newly appointed eager and suspicious policeman he watched jimmy and hesseltine for a minute or so in silence jimmy made an entry in a pocket-book all right bill said jimmy to hesseltine you can fill in again now what do you think you're doing asked the policeman rubberite road construction said jimmy they're putting down an experimental section here and this is just a preliminary testing don't they put no notice-board up with the name of the firm on they will of course as soon as the actual work begins i have their card this printed card had been one of jimmy's properties the policeman slipped it into his pocket i've no doubt it's all right said the policeman but i'll just show this card to make sure certainly said jimmy that's the thing to do you'll find they know all about it up at the station the game was up as soon as the policeman was round the corner jimmy dashed off to fetch the taxi while hesseltine completed the work of filling in the hole and getting their various properties together they had at least the satisfaction of getting clear away before the policeman returned the chairman when he heard the story said that if everybody had their rights it was probable that two of the younger members of the problem club would now be in prison but he would allow them a score of five all the same the fifth score might seem a little doubtful but the young policeman has said that he believed it was all right and if he had not would probably have taken stronger measures the chairman also refused to admit quillian's objection that the conspirators had been mistaken for imaginary people people might be real or imaginary and the subtle editor of the pig-keeper's friend had not indicated that either meaning was excluded a further protest by major biles and mr matthews against the scandalous use that had been made of their names for the firm of sanitary engineers was not taken seriously 
but the major may have been embittered by the completeness of his own failure with the help of a grey wig and beard and some shabby clothes he had intended to call at six different back doors and to represent in succession six different people a beggar a fortune-teller a vendor of cheap jewellery and so forth but the first back door at which he called was his own and there he was immediately recognised by a house-dog and by his own kitchen-maid his subsequent explanation that he had been merely doing it for a bet had not been well received he did not give details but it was gathered that mrs byles had had a good deal to say on the subject lord herngill had done very little better he had attempted no disguise at all his idea had been in the course of travel on the bakerloo tube railway to get into conversation with six different people and to tell six plausible but erroneous stories about himself his statement that he personally had driven the first train that had passed under the thames in that tube being in fact the consulting engineer of the company was received by an old lady with great interest and not the slightest suspicion he then changed into another carriage and found an opportunity to tell a young curate that though he lived within ten miles of london he had never been there in his life before he was only there then because he had to see property that he had inherited at swiss cottage and could the curate tell him at all where swiss cottage was that question was his undoing i can not only tell you said the smiling curate but as it happens i am going there myself and it will give me much pleasure to have your company and by the time that he had got rid of that curate it was hopeless to attempt his remaining impersonations within the prescribed time it was generally felt that in a matter of impersonation lord herngill on his previous character should have done better mr quillian had bestowed six shillings on six different crossing sweepers five of them had said thank you my lord and the other had said thank you captain on this he claimed to have won as it was obvious that all five crossing sweepers could not have mistaken him for the same peer it was pointed out to him by the chairman that there was not the slightest evidence that any one of those crossing sweepers had made any mistake at all for once pusely smith had failed to compete and said that he had been too busy it was suggested that his time had been taken up with spending his winnings from the previous month mr matthews also had taken no part in the competition the reason he gave was simple cowardice the ghastly breakdown of his attempt to impersonate an old lady for the purposes of the kiss problem had spoiled his nerve for anything of the kind in the future the disgraceful adventure of feldane and hesseltine seemed likely to be the nearest approach to the problem-setter's requirements until sir charles bunford was called on for his experiences sir charles claimed to have won i came to the conclusion said sir charles that the man who asks for something or tries to sell something is likely to create an atmosphere of suspicion on the other hand the man who gives something even to a complete stranger will have his explanatory story accepted without question the fact that he stands to lose by the transaction is accepted as evidence of his genuineness with this conviction and with such disguise as i thought advisable i called at various houses all in one row in the williston neighbourhood i was accompanied by a covered handcart propelled by a boy hired for the purpose inside the handcart were the gifts that i had prepared for the occupants of the houses taking from the handcart a fruit cake in a paper bag i rang at the first house and requested the dirty little girl who opened it to fetch her dear mamma mamma appeared wiping her hands on her apron and looking displeased with life in general and me in particular good morning lady i said I am instructed by my employers to ask you if you will do them the favour of accepting as a present this fruit cake of their manufacture. They are shortly opening a branch in this neighbourhood and are taking this method of making ladies acquainted with the quality of their goods. It is, in fact, an advertisement. After assuring herself again that there was nothing to pay and that the consumption of the cake would not bind her to deal with my firm, Messrs. Butterstone and Co., in future she consented to accept the cake and even to say that it seemed a straight way of doing business she inquired where the new shop would be which i told her and what the price of a similar cake would be if she ever wanted to buy one i put it at half what i had paid for it and she said it was a pleasant morning never for one moment did she doubt that i was what i had represented myself to be at the next house with equal success i presented half a pound of butter as a sample of the products of the farm creameries company and a similar story the third house got a tablet of scented soap from an enterprising chemist who was just starting in business in the neighbourhood 
at the next three houses i distributed as free advertising samples a pound of sausages a box of cigarettes and a small bottle of whisky it took longer than i had expected because the ladies had such a lot of questions to ask about the new shops that were to be opened but i finished six minutes under the hour of course i could have carried all the goods round in a basket but the handcart looked more like a house-to-house -house distribution on a large scale the decision was not given in favour until after Quillian had raised an objection he maintained that in each case sir charles had been mistaken for the same thing to wit the representative or agent in advance of a business firm but the chairman's decision that sir charles had been mistaken for six different representatives of six different firms was generally approved and as no other member had a claim to make the cheque was handed to him the chairman then opened the sealed envelope containing the problem on which their ingenuity was next to be expended it was entitled the alibi problem and the terms of it were as follows it is impossible for a man to be in two places at once but it is required so to arrange matters that bona fide evidence would be procurable that at a certain hour of a certain day or night you were in two places at once the two places to be not less than one hundred miles from each other not uninteresting said the reverend septimus cunliffe but it leaves a good deal to the discretion of the chairman who will have to decide which of us could produce the best evidence that the impossible had been accomplished by the way who is the next chairman should have been harding pope said wildersley but as he's gone it will be the member elected in his place our old friend leonard lord herngill my poor abilities are at your service said lord herngill laughing at london's lowest prices always end of chapter eight the impersonation problem chapter nine of the problem club this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by matthew gallus the problem club by barry payne chapter nine the alibi problem lord herngill read out the demand made by the editor of the pig keeper's friend on the ingenuity of the members of the problem club members were required to produce evidence that could be given in good faith that at a certain hour day or night they had been in two places at once the two places not being less than one hundred miles apart lord herngill said that he felt anxious and depressed his manner and appearance it may be added hardly bore out the statement he assigned his depression to two reasons firstly other chairmen had had the simple task of adjudicating on a point of fact he a new member a novice a mere babe as you might say was required to undertake far more delicate and difficult work and to base his decision on an estimate of evidence secondly the secretary for the evening was mr wildersley on the last occasion that wildersley had acted as secretary he had adorned the minute book with drawings of the chairman which were undoubtedly amusing and possessed of artistic merit but at the same time were calculated to bring that chairman into ridicule and contempt so you see gentlemen lord herngill continued that this is nervous work for me however i will make the plunge towards the end of dinner a telegram was handed to mr feldane over which i noticed him to be chuckling may i inquire if it had any bearing on the problem before us well it had jimmy admitted brainy work to have guessed it but i'm not on in this act i'm resting the wire really concerns heseltine's claim you two generally hunt in couples. Perhaps Mr. Hesseltine will let you put his case for him. Anything that pleases you and saves me trouble, said Hesseltine generously. I can always correct Jimmy if he makes an ass of himself. Well, said Jimmy, we can see for ourselves that Hesseltine is here tonight. I don't want to dwell on his misfortunes, but he looks much as usual. Talks in the same silly way, too. But that telegram is his evidence that he is really in Liverpool. It is signed with his name, and was handed in at a Liverpool office. I'll read it. So sorry to be unable to be with you tonight, but have promised to remain here to act as judge at local baby show. Well, it isn't for me to say anything, though I could. The evidence that Mr. Hesseltine is here, said the chairman, is good. The evidence that he is in Liverpool is less good. A telegram is not necessarily dispatched by the man whose name is signed to it. Further, it seems to me improbable that a young bachelor would have been selected for the high office which Mr. Hesseltine claims to have fulfilled. 
I think we shall do better than that. I will ask Mr. Pusley Smythe how far he has succeeded in being in two places at once. It is easier to be in one place at twice, said Pusley Smythe, but I have done what I could, considering how unversed I am in the arts of deception. The applause which greeted this statement was possibly of an ironical character. On the morning of Tuesday last, Pusley Smythe continued, I was at the rectory, Meldon Boys, where I had been spending the weekend. The village of Meldon Boy is 108 miles from London. It had been my intention to leave Meldon Boy by the 10.5 a.m. for London. I had been pressed to remain for one more night, as there was to be a performance of a pastoral play by distinguished amateurs in the grounds of the rectory on Tuesday afternoon, and it would be a pity for me to miss it. I will not conceal it from you, sir, that the said pastoral play constituted the principal reason for my departure. You have grasped these facts? Very good. Now, on the morning of Tuesday, by the first post, I received a letter from my one and only aunt, who resides in London, to say that as I was coming up to town that morning, she hoped I would lunch with her in Grosvenor Street and accompany her afterwards to hear a lecture to be given by some eminent idiot on the future of eugenics. My aunt is one of the most strong-minded and wearisome women in existence. I had been reluctant to witness the amateur performance in the rectory grounds, and I contemplated the idea of listening to a lecture on the future of eugenics with horror and loathing. That was the situation. I had to miss two birds with one stone. My first step was to telegraph my one and only aunt as follows. Regret detained here. Am writing. On the following morning, she received a letter from me, which I am able to produce in its envelope. The letter is in my own handwriting on paper stamped with the rectory address. The letter is dated Tuesday evening, and the postmark on the envelope shows that it was posted at Meldon Boy on that day. Now, that letter not only states that I had remained so as not to miss the pastoral amateurs, but also makes several statements as to their performance, every one of which can be proved to be absolutely accurate. These statements are that Miss Sykes looked charming in some pale, lilac-colored contraption, that the comedian overacted, that the weather was not entirely favorable, that some of the players seemed to find a difficulty in making themselves audible, that quite a nice sum was realized for the cottage hospital, and that the rector, in proposing a vote of thanks to the players, said that where all were so good, it would be invidious to differentiate. I have no doubt that on the strength of that letter, and the details it contains, my aunt would give evidence in good faith that to her knowledge, I must have been at Meldon Boy on Tuesday afternoon. Notwithstanding this, I left Meldon Boy on Tuesday morning by the train originally contemplated, and on Tuesday afternoon I was playing bridge at my club in London as various members of the club who met me there would attest. On the face of it, said the chairman, it looks like rather a good case. I presume that you wrote the letter to your aunt before leaving by train in the morning, and gave it to a servant with instructions to post it after the performance. Precisely so. But how did you manage to give an accurate account of the performance at which you were really not present? Well, Miss Sykes was staying at the rectory and had told me what dress she would wear. The rest was intelligent anticipation. The glass was low, and, besides, the weather is always unfavorable for pastoral plays, and some of the players always fail to make their voices carry in the open. Given village amateurs, overacting by the comedian is as certain as death. To put the receipts as a nice sum was quite safe. It was riskier to quote the rector's actual words, but he's a kindly and tactful man with a circumscribed mind, so I thought I might chance it, and it came off. The next few members, on whom the chairman called, produced nothing of interest. Some, like Heseltine, had thought of the bogus telegram. Some, like Feldane, were resting. Dr. Alden had tried an idea of his own and expressed the hope that the chairman would think better of it than he did himself. Early one morning, he had entered a tobacconist's shop where he was not known and investigated the man's stock of cigars. He found it difficult to make up his mind as to which of the three brands would suit him best. He took away with him a specimen of each and said that he would try them after luncheon and let the tobacconist know. At three that afternoon, Dr. Alden's man called at the tobacconist with a note from the doctor saying that the trial had been made and naming the brand selected. Five hundred of this brand were ordered, and a check for the exact sum was enclosed in payment. The tobacconist was to deliver the goods to the bearer of the note, as the doctor was leaving for the country at four and wished to take some of the cigars with him. This was done, and probably the tobacconist would have been willing to swear in consequence that Dr. Alden was in London until four that day. As a matter of fact, the doctor had left for the north by express shortly after ten that morning. Yes, said the chairman, you convinced the tobacconist that you were in London when you were not, 
just as Pusley Smythe convinced his aunt that he was not in London when he was. In each case, it is the evidence of one person only. Have you done any better, Mr. Wildersley? Better, said Wildersley cheerfully. I should rather think I have. I should have made out the club check for the prize to my own order already, but for the fact that I prefer the formal routine. Cast your chairmanical eye over this sketchbook. It is filled with pencil drawings made from time to time, if not oftener, by the eminent Wildersley. The last few pages were made at the political meeting at Glasgow last week. They are dated in my own hand. There are notes as to the color also in my hand. They are in my sketchbook. If they are not proof positive that I was at that meeting, then what are they? All the same, I was in London, while that meeting was being held, and can produce countless witnesses who saw me and spoke to me. The chairman looked carefully at the drawings. Not done from photographs, I suppose? No, my lord, said Wildersley. All genuine handwork and done on the spot. Lord Herngill compared them with previous drawings in the book. These look to me, he said, as if they were done by somebody who was trying to imitate your technique, but had not quite got it. Yes, said Wildersley, that finishes us. You have it. The other artist member and I went into collaboration in this enterprise. Austin went to Glasgow and made the sketches in the book with what he was pleased to call an imitation of the worst of Wildersleyan mannerisms. I remained in London, giving my famous impersonation of myself. I added the date and manuscript notes afterwards. Still, if this book fell into the hands of somebody who had not the full use of his eyes, and very few people have, he might use it as evidence in good faith that I was at Glasgow at that date. Undoubtedly. I shall not forget your claim. Meanwhile, is there any other? Yes said Sir Charles Bunford placidly. I think my claim to have established an alibi is stronger than any you have heard yet. Birmingham is more than a hundred miles from London. A certain butler in Birmingham would swear that he saw me and spoke to me on a certain afternoon. A photographer in Birmingham will swear that he photographed me on that same afternoon and would be able to produce the negative. Yet, during the whole of that afternoon, I was in London, as the evidence of many of my friends would show and all the evidence would be given in good faith. And how was this miracle accomplished? the chairman asked. I'll tell you the story as briefly as I can. I went to stay for a fortnight with an old friend of mine, a bachelor named Fraser, who has a house outside Birmingham. He is a keen ornithologist. He employs in the preparation of specimens, and so on, a curious character called Mitten, who is just as keen on birds as Fraser himself. Fraser only has Mitten's spare time, Mitten's regular work is with a Birmingham photographer, for whom he does developing, and also has charge of the stock of negatives. Fraser is quite unlike me in the face, except that we both have the same deficiency of color in the hair, but we are of about the same height and build. There is also a slight similarity in our voices. That was the rough material that I had at my disposal, and no doubt you can guess how I got my results from it. You'd better continue, said the chairman, smiling. On the day before I left, I pointed out to Fraser that a similarity in mass often prevented a dissimilarity in detail from being noticed, and that the attitude of expectant attention is a frequent source of error. Fraser asked me, as I had thought he would, what I meant and what I was getting at. I replied that by taking advantage of two facts I had mentioned, he could probably get himself mistaken for me. He said that nobody would make the mistake. I said that Hammond's butler would make it on the following afternoon if he cared to try the experiment. I'd like to try it, but it's impossible. That butler has known me for the last two years, and he has only seen you four or five times in the afternoon. How could he be taken in? He has always seen you in dark and chastened clothing, such as it is your custom to wear. He has always seen me, with a gray bowler, a light suit, white spats, and a distinctive necktie. He expects to see me tomorrow afternoon, because I borrowed an umbrella there today, and said I would bring it back then. All you have to do is wear my clothes and hand in that umbrella. He will expect to see me. He will actually see my clothes on a man of about my figure. The hall at the Hammond's house is rather dark, and you will have the sun behind you. It's quite certain the man will be mistaken. It was tried, and happened as I had foretold. The butler addressed Fraser as Sir Charles. But how did you manage about the photograph? That was done by means of a bet. Old Mitten is a great believer in the system, and has his own infallible method for cataloging photographic negatives, so that a mistake is impossible. I chaffed him about it and told him that I would cause him to enter two lots of negatives wrongly. I offered to bet a sovereign on it, and he accepted with avidity. I then settled with Fraser what we would do. Fraser booked an appointment with a photographer for the morning that I had left for London, and I booked another for myself in the afternoon, the appointments being made by post. 
I kept Fraser's appointment just before I left for the station, and Fraser kept mine in the afternoon after he had finished with Hammond's butler. Mitten found out what had been done, of course, catalogued the negatives correctly, and has collected his sovereign. But I understand that he has not informed his employer on the ground that the employer dislikes larks. The entries in the appointment book remain as they were, so that it is on record that I was photographed in the afternoon, though my photographic negatives entered under my name are really those taken from me in the morning. This, said the chairman, is the most elaborate attempt we have had. Nobody else claims to have been seen in two places at the same time. I do not say that the evidence is perfect, but then the evidence of an alibi must always have a hole in it somewhere. Does anybody claim to have beaten it? Nobody? Then I have no hesitation in deciding in Sir Charles's favor, and I congratulate him on the distinction, which, so far, has been held by Mr. Pusley Smythe alone, of winning the prize on two successive occasions. The next problem was now read out. It was entitled The Three Penny Problem and ran as follows. It is required to offer a half crown for a three penny bus fare and to receive the change wholly in three penny bits. No gift or promise of a gift may be made to the conductor to induce him to give the change in this form. That's the easiest we've had, grumbled Major Biles. So of course it's my turn to be in the chair and I can't compete. End of chapter nine. Chapter 10 of The Problem Club. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Problem Club by Barry Payne. The Threepenny Problem. Child's Play, said Major Biles. That's what the problem is. It is required to offer a half crown for a threepenny bus fare and to receive the change wholly in threepenny bits. And you're not allowed to give the conductor anything or promise him anything as an inducement to let you have the nine threepennies. It's my belief that you'd only have to ask in a civil way and any conductor would do it for you. A more obliging set of men than the London bus conductors couldn't be found, except, perhaps, the London police. I don't call it a problem at all. You'll all win, of course, and that will mean a comfortable tenor for every member of the club, except myself, just because I'm stuck up here in the chair. It's scandalous. He snipped the end of a cigar ferociously, and lit it as if he took pleasure in its destruction, which, indeed, may have been the case. However, I must do my duty, and I'll call upon my reverend friend, Mr. Cunliffe, to tell us what he has done about it. My story is a sad one, said the reverend Septimus Cunliffe, it leads me to believe that our chairman has overestimated the amiability of the conductors and underestimated the difficulty of the problem. I gave a half crown for a threepenny fare and told the man that it would be a great kindness if he could let me have my change in threepenny pieces. He never said a word but handed me a florin and three coppers. Did you hear what I asked you? I said to him. Oh, yes, he said. I heard. If you want all them threepennies, you'd better get them out of the blanky offertory bag next Sunday. Extraordinary, said the chairman. Something must have occurred to ruffle the man's temper. Did you find any difficulty, Bunford? I failed absolutely said sir charles bunford no doubt i made a mistake in putting my request during the busy hour of the morning the conductor looked resigned but sardonic want it all in threepennies do you he said would you like them of any particular year i said that the date was immaterial any year would do that's all right he said 
then you can wait for next year's and he gave me a shilling a sixpence and ninepence in what is generally described at the inquest as bronze of course said the chairman it was a mistake to bother the man when he was busy and a little tact is wanted if i'd been in for this competition myself i shouldn't just have asked for my change in threepennies i should have given some plausible reason for wanting it with great respect sir said mr quillian i must differ from you i had the same idea and tried it i told the conductor that i had a bet that i would get my change entirely in threepennies i thought it would appeal to his sporting instinct all he said was you've lost then and gave me the change without as much as one threepenny in it seemed rather pleased about it too i'd much the same experience said dr alden as i gave the man my half-crown i mentioned that i was a collector of threepenny bits and asked him if he could help me he gave me two shillings and three pennies well he said if you like to step off at the bank of england and ask the chief cashier to give you threepennies for that little lot you can mention my name it's quite possible said the chairman that those conductors had not got the threepennies to give you i go for days sometimes without as much as seeing a threepenny bit it really looks as if the problem presented more difficulties than i had at first supposed did you manage to surmount them mr matthews can't say i did though i took a lot of trouble about it there's no two ways about it if you put an unreasonable request to a complete stranger whether he's a bus conductor or anything else you're likely to be sat on and not get what you want either i picked a bus in the slack time running nearly empty with a good-natured looking conductor i chatted with him for five minutes and got him friendly disposed towards me before i even mentioned threepennies then i asked him if he got many of them he said he took enough of them to fill a pint pot some days and wished he didn't they were finicky things to handle and easily dropped well that was a good start i gave him a half crown for my threepenny ticket and told him that i would be glad to take as many threepenny bits off his hands as he liked to give me said i wanted them for a young nephew of mine the man was quite willing and if anybody had offered me twenty pounds just then for my chance of winning the prize to-night i'd have refused it if anybody would give me twenty pence for the same chance at the present moment i'd jump at it the trouble came in just as the chairman has indicated the man looked through his silver and did his best for me but one solitary threepenny was all he could raise i got that one of course but one is not nine it was just rotten bad luck he said that nineteen days in twenty he could have given me a dozen of them but he supposed it had to happen so you called that bad luck said the honourable james feldane gloomily not half as bitter as mine we'll have the story of your failure jimmy said the chairman failure's nothing i've failed before and shall do again it's what happened afterwards that worries me all the same i don't know that i should have failed if i had simply trusted to my own judgment but the woman looked so smart and brainy that i let myself be influenced though she was really talking clotted nonsense you're getting on too quickly said the chairman to what woman do you refer how should i know 
i haven't an idea what her name is she was one of a pack of hens that i found cackling in my sister's drawing-room they were discussing their maids and how to manage them same as women have always done since the year one the brainy-looking one said that when she had a reasonable order to give a maid she always put it in the form of a request but if she had an unreasonable request to make to a maid she always put it in the form of an order she said that this always bluffed the maid out i thought there might be something in that bit of wisdom if you give an order in an ordinary way as if it were a matter of course it may get taken in that spirit anyway i thought i'd try it with the bus conductor i gave him my half-crown and said in my light and casual way threepenny ticket and give me my change in threepenny bits he didn't say anything he just glared at me if he had said anything it would probably have scorched the top off the bus he gave me my change with never a threepenny bit in it and then glared some more he'd got rather a good glare broke up my nerves anyhow but the next corner i hopped off now mark the sequel a little later i owed a taxi eightpence gave the man a half-crown and waited for my change sorry sir said the man but i shall have to give you six threepenny bits i've got no other silver and that's the way things happen when you want a thing you can't get it and when you don't want it it's chucked at you well really said the chairman without a blush as i foresaw this turns out to be a very difficult problem no interruptions please i know that i did not actually say that it was very difficult but it was in my mind it looked easy as i pointed out in my opening remarks but nobody knows better than i do that appearances are often deceptive i shall call upon our great expert and prize-winner mr pusely smythe i am confident that he will have realised the difficulties and taken his measures accordingly mr pusely smythe smiled grimly and sardonically thank you sir he said for your kind words i do not want to brag but i gave this problem my very earnest consideration and i do think that i realise some at least of the difficulties before me i saw firstly that it was possible and even probable that the conductor might not have nine threepenny bits to give me now some company promoters have found out that the best way to get gold out of a gold mine is to start by putting a little gold into it i adopted that principle i selected a certain bus on a certain route i arranged that on the journey just before i made my appearance no fewer than twelve passengers would pay their fares with threepenny bits it only required a little organization if you tell a human boy or even a human girl to take your threepenny bit pay a penny bus fare with it and keep the change you get willing service without any troublesome demand for explanations secondly i had to have a story to tell the conductor that would induce him to oblige me i was prepared to tell him that a friend had promised me that if i could collect a thousand threepenny bits for the london hospital he would add double that amount to it i noticed sir an unworthy expression of suspicion on the face of my learned friend mr quillian my story for the conductor was not only plausible it was actually true i was the man who had made that promise to myself 
if i am not my own friend who is further i was so absolutely certain of success that i remitted the sum in question thirty two pounds ten shillings to the hospital and have a receipt for it when i deducted the thirty two pounds ten shillings expenditure from the hundred and ten pounds prize i calculated that it would still leave a living wage for myself well that was the position i saw that there were two main difficulties in this problem and i had arranged to meet both of them quite so said the chairman as i've always said these things need to be worked out in a clear-minded and systematic way and the result was all right pusely smythe's smile was more sardonic than ever much depends on the point of view it was all right from some points of view punctually at the time i had fixed i took my seat on the top of the bus i had selected about a minute later the conductor came up to collect the fares i felt for my half-crown i had not got any half-crown i had no money on me whatever i had inadvertently left my money at home there was nobody on the bus to whom i could apply for temporary assistance well there was no help for it the conductor was weary but firm he told me to hop off the bus and not to try it on again i hopped it may have been all right from the point of view of the other competitors but from my own point of view it was less satisfactory and it only shows as we all know that you may lose your game by missing a perfectly easy shot mr wildersley a r a had demanded threepennies from a conductor on the ground that he was collecting them the conductor had replied that he was there to take the fares not to supply private museums mr austin had met a most obliging conductor who however had no threepennies in his possession lord herngill and mr hesseltine had only contemptuous refusals to record this of course happened before the war in times when the gentler kindlier and more refined sex has charge of our public vehicles the problem might prove easy of solution well the chairman began it looks as if the whole lot of you duffers had failed here the secretary lord herngill whispered a few warning words in his ear and the chairman nodded assent yes he resumed it may look to you duffers as if the whole lot of you had failed but of course that would be wrong nobody has succeeded in getting nine threepennies in change but in that case the nearest approximation to that number wins mr matthews got one threepenny and conformed to the conditions nobody else even got one therefore i declare mr matthews to be the winner and the club cheque for one hundred and ten pounds will be drawn to his order jimmy feldane confided his private sorrows to his friend hesseltine i don't mind old matthews winning he's a genial old bird and what he doesn't know about the noble art of dining ain't worth worrying over but there is just one thing that makes me want to kick myself round and round this room till i get giddy when matthews told us his yarn he said he'd take twenty pence for his chance of the prize i ought to have been on to it in a flash if not sooner one and eight for a sporting chance of a hundred and ten pounds is good enough the more i think of it the more i see that i ought not to be allowed out 
except in charge of a nursemaid oh we all missed that chance said hesseltine maybe a little drink might do us some good while they were taking the medicine indicated the chairman read out the problem which was to employ them during the following month the fantastic editor of the pig keeper's friend had entitled it the q loan problem and its terms were as follows it is required in three days to borrow as many things as possible the name of each thing to begin with the letter q nothing counts for the competition if its name is on the list of more than one member no money may be given or promised in respect of any loan and to-morrow morning bright and early said jimmy i'm off to the zoo in a taxi to see if i can't borrow their quagger End of chapter ten chapter eleven of the problem club this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by keir in auckland new zealand the problem club by barry payne chapter eleven the q loan problem the problem which came up for adjudication on this occasion was as follows it is required in three days to borrow as many things as possible the name of each thing to begin with the letter q nothing counts for the competition if its name is on the list of more than one member no money may be given or promised in respect of any loan i've arranged this said mr austin who was the chairman for the evening so as to avoid any overstrain for myself i shall call on that notorious painter and decorator mr wildersley to begin with his list when he has finished he will call on somebody else the second man in his turn will name the third and so on if anything is read out by another member which is also down on your own list hold up your hand the secretary will keep the score that leaves me absolutely nothing to do until it's time to announce the winner and i shall probably go to sleep so don't make any disturbing noises please you can begin now wildersley my score is six said wildersley unless some of you selfish men have had the same ideas as i have on my first day i borrowed two things one of which people seem to show hesitation about lending while the other was a thing that very few people have got to lend nowadays in fact i borrowed a quid and a quill pen many hands went up this is painful and surprising said wildersley and reduces my score to four well, on the second day i visited a female relative said that i had a cold coming on and had no difficulty in borrowing some quinine and a quilt but a show of hands indicated that others had found it equally easy well that brings me down to two but the last two are good i doubt if any other member could have thought of them or could have borrowed them in any case but i happen to know a painter who's got whole wardrobes full of costumes uses them for his alleged pictures from him i borrowed firstly a cue i appeal to the chairman said jimmy feldane confidently that word is spelled with a k no said the chairman you are probably thinking of the gardens of the same name in any case it's the thing that they have outside the pit entrance and you can't borrow it that will be for mr wildersley to explain i did not borrow a crowd outside a pit entrance said wildersley but i did borrow the tie of a wig which is another meaning of the word that's one to me anyhow and i also borrowed a quiff surely sir said mr quillian that word is spelt with a c the chairman consulted a useful work of reference and announced that the word was spelled in both ways may we have your authority for that statement standard dictionary and will you define a standard dictionary for the purposes of this competition 
for the purposes of this competition, a standard dictionary is any dictionary that was published subsequently to the 18th century and cost more than five pence halfpenny originally. It doesn't much matter really, for as the word is also on my own list, neither Wildersley nor I can score it. You might have said that before, said the chairman. It looks as if you were giving me trouble on purpose. And it's quite possible that his surmise was correct. The Problem Club does not allow its chairman to sleep when on duty. Sir Charles Bunford requested him to state what Mr. Wildersley's score was, and it may not have been from inadvertence that Wildersley neglected to name his successor and left it to the chairman to do so. He called upon Dr. Alden. Well, said the doctor, I had borrowed quinine, of course, but that's been ruled out. I also borrowed some quassia from the same man. No hands up? I think I score one for quassia, if the chairman admits it. The chairman consulted his dictionary and said that quassia appeared to be all right. He was immediately asked by Mr. Pusley Smythe if he could inform the members whether quassia was a summer drink or an intermittent fever. At the present moment, said Mr. Austin severely, I am giving my most eager and concentrated attention to the conscientious discharge of my arduous duties. I cannot be interrupted by purely frivolous questions. Dr. Alden will proceed. I further borrowed a quadrant and a thermometer. I fear, said the chairman, that I must rule that the word thermometer does not begin with the letter Q. Uh, your rapid grasp of these fine points, sir, impels my admiration. But with great respect, I would point out that this thermometer contained mercury, and therefore, in borrowing the thermometer, I borrowed quicksilver. My remaining loans consisted of a quarto and a quotation. But other members had borrowed both a quarto and a quotation. Dr. Alden was accordingly left with a score of three. Major Biles, who came next, had done better. In the course of a morning stroll with a neighbouring landowner over his property, he had borrowed some weird things. His list consisted of a quarry, a quicksand, some quickset, quitchgrass, and quicklime. And, as none of these things had been borrowed by any other member, he scored five. But he did not seem entirely happy about it. The trouble with these problems, he said, is that one has to do absolutely idiotic things, and consequently one is likely to be thought an absolute idiot. I did the best I could. I invented quite a plausible story about the geological friend to account for the quarry and the quicksand, but I believe that my neighbour goes about saying that poor old Biles is far from well, and tapping his forehead to indicate the nature of my complaint. It's most unpleasant. Still, five ain't such a bad score. How did you get on with that quagga, Jimmy? Nothing doing, said Jimmy. I went to the zoo just as I said I would. But if you ask me, the whole place is rotten with red tape and officialism. They wouldn't lend me the blessed quagga though I promised them I'd return it in five minutes, said it was not customary to lend out the animals, and a lot of silly talk like that, quite obstinate about it too. I'd got Hasseltine there to take a snapshot of me shepherding the quagga in the wilds of Regent Park, and it simply meant our valuable time thrown away. Also it appeared that quaggas are out of print, and they'd not got one. But quite apart from that, I'm not claiming to have won, I've only got two things down on my list that have not been claimed so far. The first was the Queen of Spades from a pack of cards, and the second is the Four Kings from the same pack. I don't spell the word king with a Q, but the four of them are a catorce at PK. But a score of two's no use, and I shall probably be described on my tombstone as brainy but unfortunate. Meanwhile, I notice a sunny smile on the face of our padre as if he were a prize winner. He might tell us how he did it. The Reverend Septimus Cunliffe had certainly been energetic and industrious. To start with, he had called upon an old friend of his, a man of some learning, 
with an interest in music and a fair library. Here, he had no difficulty in borrowing Quixote, Quevedo, Quintilian, Quain, and some quadrilles, quartets, and quintets. He engaged his host in a discussion as to the precise meaning of a quip, a quirk, and a quiddity, persuaded him to write down an instance of each, and borrowed the instances. He borrowed a quatrain of his host's composition and twenty-four sheets of notepaper, which make a choir. The next two days were less productive, but he borrowed a specimen of quartz from one man and a dog, which was unquestionably a quadruped from another. A lady, who was interested in archery, lent him a quiver, loans of a quoit, quart of milk, and a quarter of coal were also negotiated. But all the same, his smile of self-congratulation was premature. He was not destined to score eighteen, for the simple reason that he had not borrowed a single thing which was not on the list of either Lord Herngill, or Mr. Quillian, or Mr. Pusley Smythe, and they in their turn could not score because everything on their lists was also on the parson's. Industry had cancelled industry. Ingenuity had destroyed ingenuity. The only other member who could produce a score at all was Mr. Matthews. He registered a modest score of one for having borrowed a quarrel. It was in vain that Hasseltine maintained that you could pick a quarrel but could not borrow one. The chairman referred to his standard dictionary and learned that a quarrel was not necessarily a dispute. It might be a diamond-shaped pane of glass, which was, in fact, what Mr. Matthews had borrowed. Well, said the chairman, Major Biles is the winner, and I think he deserves to be. The rest of you were a tame set of sheep, laborious and ingenious, but without any proper spirit of enterprise. But nobody could walk out calmly one morning and borrow a quarry and a quicksand unless he were really adventurous. To do that was magnificent and Elizabethan. I confess that I should like to know what the neighbours said when the Major borrowed the quitch grass. Oh, the old chap didn't say much, said Major Biles. That was the last thing I borrowed, and by that time he seemed rather worried and nervous. I told him quite a good story, too, about a nephew in London who wanted a specimen for botanical purposes. The real trouble was that, as it had to be alone, I sent the beastly weed back to him three days later. That was when he decided I really must have a touch of the sun, or had given away to the habit, or something of that kind. But I shall live it down. Anyway, I've won, and I don't care if it snows. Quite so, in the problems of this club, as in the problems of life, it sometimes happens that courage and character will do more than low cunning to effect a solution, and I hope that this will be a lesson to certain members who, by a series of vexatious and needless questions, have deprived me of my proper rest this evening. However, I shall shortly be taking it out of them at bridge, and they have my forgiveness. If, said Pusley Smythe, the chairman has finished infringing the prerogative of our padre by delivering a sermon, he will perhaps inform us what the next problem is. Certainly, said the chairman cheerfully. No, I was forgetting. It is Dr. Alden's turn to take the chair next time. But complications have arisen. I have had a letter from the talented editor of The Pig Keeper's Friend, who sets our problems and, as you will remember, was introduced to us by Lord Herngill. It appears that, in consequence of his personal knowledge of the esteemed editor, Lord Herngill would have an unfair advantage in this next competition, and is therefore, with his own consent, disqualified for it. But for the same reason, he is specially qualified to adjudicate on the problem. I have mentioned the matter to Herngill and the doctor, and they are both willing to exchange their turns as chairman, so that, subject to your approval, Herngill will be the chairman at our next meeting. I will put it to you, gentlemen. The proposal met with general approval. That's all right, said the chairman. Then we can have the card tables brought in. And if only I can manage to cut with the major, I fancy that our opponents will have a pretty thin time. This is his evening. 
"'I do not wish,' said Mr. Quillian solemnly, "'to dispute the statement, but even now we do not know what the problem for next month is to be.' "'Well, you're right,' said the chairman. "'You're absolutely right. It's funny, but if I forget a thing once, I nearly always forget it twice. However, as a matter of fact, I don't yet know it myself. Here it is, in its sealed envelope. We will investigate it.' He tore open the envelope and glanced at its contents. "'Well,' he said, "'I really don't know why he made so much fuss about it. "'You couldn't have anything simpler,' he calls it, "'the pig-keeper's problem. "'This is all it is. "'It is required to buy a copy of the current issue of the pig-keeper's friend.' "'I don't see any difficulty about that, do you, Leonard?' "'But Leonard declined to be drawn.' I should like to have notice of that question, he said. End of chapter 11. Recording by Keir. Chapter 12 of The Problem Club. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Problem Club by Barry Payne The Pig Keeper's Problem Well, gentlemen, said the chairman, Lord Herngill, you have been required to purchase a copy of the current issue of The Pig Keeper's Friend. It is generally published on the 7th of every month, but if the talented editor happens to be thinking about something else at the time, as occasionally happens, it may come out a few days later. It is published according to the law, but it cannot be said to court circulation. It is exposed for sale in certain places, but I doubt if any copy has been purchased by the general public for the last year, at any rate not until the members of this club went on the hunt for it. How did you get on, Major Biles? Wish I'd never gone in for it, snapped the Major. I told my regular newsagent to get me a copy. He said he hadn't heard of it, but would make inquiries. At the end of a week he came to me with a story that, as far as he had been able to learn, the paper had discontinued publication a year before. I knew that was a lie, of course, and told him so, and said I'd finished with him. There's only one other newsagent near me, and I had to go to him. His beastly boy leaves the wrong papers at the house every morning, and seems to think I'm a socialist like himself. The end of it will be that I shall have to eat my own words and go back to the other man. Destroys all discipline, that kind of thing. Dr. Alden, Pusley Smith, and several others had hunted trade lists and directories in vain. Mr. Matthews had lavished money on advertisements, offering a sovereign for a copy of the current issue of The Pig Keeper's Friend, and had received no reply. Sir Charles Bunford had written to an old friend who held a high position at the British Museum, asking him to get a hold of some recent number of The Pig Keeper's Friend, and let him have the address at which it was published. After some delay, the friend replied that he had seen a copy of the periodical, and that it appeared to be the work of a lunatic, and that the address given in it was the Impersonation Society, Boswell Court, Fleet Street. "'It certainly looked to me,' said Sir Charles, "'as if I had got hold of the right end of the stick. I found the office, which appeared to occupy the whole of the top floor of the building. The name of the society was painted on the outer doors, and underneath was the legend, "Hours ten to four. It was then eleven in the morning. I knocked and rang, and could get no answer at all, and I could hear no sound of any activity within. I came back at three in the afternoon with the same result. I then sent a letter, saying that I required a copy of the current number of the paper, and wished to know what amount I should forward for the purpose, and to make it quite certain I enclosed a stamped and addressed envelope. Well, I got a reply with an illegible signature. It said that no retail business was done at the office, but that I could apply for the copy through the usual channels. I still thought that I was on the right line, and gave the address to my news agent and set him to work. The answer he got was that the current issue was out of print, all copies having been allocated. So there I stuck. He came rather near it, though, said the chairman. Suppose we shorten matters. Does any member claim to have won this competition? Our friend Jimmy has been looking rather pleased with himself all the evening. "'Have I?' said Jimmy. "'Well, I don't mind admitting that I've jolly good reason to be pleased with myself just now, quite apart from the competition. I've won that too, as it happens, but I don't take much credit for it. 
of course you could say that it was due to the improved habits and all that and i suppose that was so more or less but the fact remains that i wasn't even thinking about the thing at the time and if i hadn't forgotten my cigarette case it would never have happened so if you don't call it luck what are you to call it mr feldane said the chairman with great gravity you are beginning your story at the wrong end that is with the criticism of it i must ask you to tell us simply what happened from the very commencement and as coherently as possible certainly said jimmy indulgently any old way that you happen to fancy well to start with though as a matter of fact it had been going on for more than a week before they asked me to dine with them at the house on wimbledon common so naturally i jumped at it i won't say i had always been addicted to the scenery of wimbledon but there were certain private reasons private reasons for dining at wimbledon said hesseltine reflectively i think i know our name don't i wish you wouldn't interrupt just at the moment when i'm being coherent i was going to dine at wimbledon and it takes some doing to get there my own little car was in hospital and the natural way seems to be to take a taxi and let it tick up the two pences until i wanted to go back then i reflected that i had decided to give up all silly extravagance and on inquiry i found that there was a place called waterloo station from which i could book to wimbledon so i did so i didn't smoke on my way out which must have been a kind of absent-mindedness it was on my way back that i found that i had forgotten my cigarette case now nothing makes you feel you must smoke so much as the knowledge that you can't i hopped out at Vauxhall and found a taxi right away i'd got all the luck in the world that night i told the driver where to go and to stop at a tobacconist's and do it soon the shop he stopped at in the back street of a side street didn't look up to much but i was desperate and ready to smoke anything that was called a turkish cigarette behind the counter i found a fat middle-aged man reading a book he gave me something that would do took my money and called me sir but he was no more a tobacconist than i am tobacconists may do a lot of funny things but they don't read the agamemnon of aeschylus in the original greek which is what this blighter was doing nor do they have manicured nails and an oxford intonation his attempt at a cockney accent was one of the most pathetic failures i've ever met however that's not the point the point is that on the counter was a small pile of copies of the current number of the pig keeper's friend the number consisted of sixteen pages and they were very small pages and the price was one pound but i did not hesitate i bought my copy and i have it in my pocket now i'll hand it up to our chairman i've had a glance at it myself and i'm inclined to agree with that museum johnny it's got nothing to do with pigs it's mostly poetry and the rest is foolishness it beats me altogether the chairman examined the copy of the paper which had been handed to him there is no doubt about it he said this is a copy of the current issue and mr feldane assures us that he bought it no other claim is put forward the club's cheque for one hundred and ten pounds will therefore be drawn to the order of mr feldane has any member anything to add i have said mr matthews the whole thing wants clearing up and i hope our chairman will clear it is our problem-setter really a lunatic what is he doing with this weird paper of his what's the impersonation society who was the over-educated tobacconist we'd like the whole story and to this there was general assent i've no objection said lord herngill willie bunting has empowered me to tell you anything i like about him including the truth the fact is that in this problem the members of this club have come up against another organization the impersonation society which is one of bunting's curious inventions i first knew him as an undergraduate i thought a good deal of his ability both as a poet and as an amateur actor he was also no end of a lark he was not a lunatic but he had endless eccentricities he had no ambitions a contempt for public opinion and a determination to do just as he liked he was sent down for impersonating one of the proctors he was beautifully made up and looked exactly like that proctor but he had the misfortune to meet the original in trumpington street this disaster did not greatly trouble him he had more money than was good for him and was not intending to take up any profession he came to london and shortly afterwards he started the impersonation society his theory was that the ordinary holiday is a mistake and that what a tired man or woman wants is not only a change of place but a change of personality 
in order to get a complete rest you must for the time being be somebody else you must dress and live like the character you have assumed and you must even try to think like them i am by no means sure that there is not something to be said for the idea there must be plenty of people who think so for the membership of the society has increased every year and includes some of the very last people that you would expect to find in such an organization for instance the man that jimmy found in the tobacconist's shop in the vauxhall neighborhood is in reality the headmaster and proprietor of a large and successful private school all through term time he is treated with intense respect little boys call him sir and tremble before him his assistant masters treat him with a deference which they are probably very far from feeling he lives in an atmosphere of sickening and insincere flattery and smoking is strictly prohibited so in his holiday he becomes a tobacconist's assistant smokes all day goes about in his shirt sleeves treats customers with respect is respected by nobody himself professes no more virtues than he really has and thoroughly enjoys it he says that it keeps him sane the shop itself is of course the property of the society and the resident manager trains those members who wish to take a holiday there i should perhaps explain why sir charles bunford was unable to obtain entrance to the rooms of the society he misinterpreted the legend on the door the hours are ten to four but they are from ten at night to four in the morning i may add that it was once raided by the police to the intense disappointment of the police and to the great joy of the members particularly willie bunting but i must tell you something of the pig keeper's friend willie's nearest relative is an irascible uncle who told him that he was wasting his life willie said that on the contrary he was enjoying it the uncle maintained that willie did nothing and willie replied that he wrote poetry then the indignant uncle did a foolish thing he said that he was prepared to bet a hundred pounds that willie never had a poem accepted by the editor of any existing periodical published in london willie jumped at that bet that moribund monthly the pig keeper's friend was at that time in the market it had lost its circulation and had never had advertisements the wretched enthusiast who had brought it into being was harshly sick of it willie offered a fiver for it which was more than it was worth and instantly became the proprietor he then appointed himself editor and in his editorial capacity accepted one of his own poems and printed it in the next issue a prefatory note said that the editor had no doubt that the wary pig-keeper would be glad to beguile his hours of leisure with the following poem by his esteemed contributor william bunting willie sent a copy of it to his uncle received his hundred and was cut out of the uncle's last will and testament having acquired the magazine willie proceeded to make it the organ of the impersonation society he still printed his own poems in it and occasionally mine but it was principally devoted to the cryptic record of the many strange activities of the impersonation society the original title was retained and occasional references to pigs and pig-keeping will be found in it for instance in the current number there are a number of spoof inquiries from agonized pig-keepers seeking the expert advice of the editor in their difficulties one of them asks how in the event of his pig swarming he is to know which of them is the queen the editor's replies are humorous and in some cases i regret to say rabelaisian the present issue of the paper was on sale at the tobacconists it has also been offered in the public streets by a supposed newsvendor every day for the last month the only copy purchased was bought by jimmy who found it by accident as the paper is sold only by members mr matthews will understand why his advertisements fail to get any result and now that i've answered your questions i'd like to put one to our prize winner go ahead said jimmy how many times have you dined at wimbledon in the last week four times as it happens you see the views there over the common are really you needn't continue you've said enough i'm sure that i may offer you the hearty congratulations of the club on your engagement well i'm blessed said jimmy i am engaged i'm pleased and proud to say but how on earth did you know in many ways and i'll tell you one only one thing on earth could have made you forget your cigarette case and naturally the next thing to do was to drink to the health of jimmy and his future bride and it was done with great enthusiasm and here the chronicles of the problem club has come to an end 
the story of how willie bunting became a member of the club and subsequently retired from it and how the solution of one problem brought the rev septimus cunliffe into the police court and how the solution of another made mr matthews miss his dinner and how a negro failed to get into the club and how a girl of seventeen was actually elected these things with many others must remain hidden in the club archives end of chapter twelve end of the problem club by barry payne